So I started presenting at iOS DevScout Meetup one year ago in January, and I kicked off my presentation by introducing myself in Mandarin. And with every other presentation, I wanted to introduce myself in other official languages, Singapore. So one year ago, it was like this. Ni hao, wo jiao ma jie, wo shi chong Poland. The next time, I introduced myself in Bahasa. Hello, nama saya Maciej. Saya berasal dari Poland. And I promise that the very next time I'll introduce myself in Tamil. <laughs> Which is kind of difficult. <laughs> so uh, let me try this one. Vanakam, yen peyer Maciej. Nan wurde Poland kudimagen. So, uh, hello everyone, my name is Maciej and I'm from Poland. And I run a blog called Swifting.io. You can check it out. We write about Swift with my friends, about unit testing and iOS related stuff. And today I will be presenting about unit testing. On a daily basis, I work for BBM. Uh, BBM is a messaging application, and what's great about working at BBM is the way we work. And the way we work is we uh, use extreme programming, we do pair programming and test-driven development. So on a daily basis, I do not program, I do not write code on my own. Uh, I have a colleague who I work with. We have one workstation which has connected to mice and to keyboards, we uh, solve problems together, we try to uh, you know, come up with the best ideas, we share knowledge. And we also use test-driven development, so we write unit tests first for our source code, and then we uh, implement the desired behavior for the application for objects. So, uh, this presentation will be about synchronous unit testing, but first, let's imagine you are working for a messaging application and you are given a task uh, from your product manager and you are told to load all the messages uh, that user got uh, when application launches. So, we have this struct that represents messages uh, that were sent to our uh, users message has an author, a text, probably an, an identifier. And we are given this protocol called message loader. It is just one method called load. And it has some callback that takes uh, an array of messages as an argument. So this probably tells us that this is an asynchronous operation. And we have this message loader class that uh, conforms to this protocol. It implements the load method, and for simplicity, it just calls, uh, invokes callback with an empty array of messages. But it's okay for us at this moment, at this stage. Let's implement this behavior we wanted to have. So we need to load all the messages when application launches. So first, let's initialize a loader on applic UI application delegate uh, on an object that conforms to this protocol. We have a loader, and we need to call load when application launches, right? So let's call load, and that's it. We can maybe print, because product manager doesn't tell us what to do with it. And it doesn't compile for some reason. That's okay. But as I told you, in BBM, first we write unit tests, then we implement the behavior. So in test driven development, we follow this uh, red green refactor rhythm. First, we need to write a test that fails, then we uh, implement the behavior that our test uh, test. <laughs> And then we are free to refactor when our tests are passing. So let's write tests first. Uh, some terms for you. Uh, SUT 
uh, refers to system or subject under test, it's good to have a common name for every test case that uh, describes object that we currently test. Because if you have uh, 500 of uh, files with tests, and in every test object under test is named differently, you, yeah, good luck with finding which object is tested. So uh, SUT in our uh, test refers to object under test. There is also, uh, we can also divide the test into three phases, arrange, act, and assert. So in the first phase, we just initialize our SUT, we set it in a certain state. Uh, then we perform an action on our SUT, and after that we can perform some assertions. Something should happen with our object, and we can assert that the wanted behavior actually happened. So our behavior, load com called in application, will finish launching with options. So let's create uh, a mocked message loader that allows us to test the behavior. So let's create this class, message loader mock, that conforms to our message loader protocol. Again, we need to click quickly implement a method called load. And let's uh, call our callback with empty array of messages. And because it's a knock, it's good to uh, test that this method was called. And we can do that by introducing some Boolean variable. And whenever our message, our method will be called, we just set this variable to true. So state will change from false to true, and we will be able to assert this that this actually happened. So then we need to write our unit test. So in our range phase, let's create our SCT, which is of type uh, UI application delegate, or rather delegate. Then we can create our mock loader. <coughs> and we can replace, oops, we can replace loader on our SCT to the mocked loader. And we can check here that actually value on our loader is false. So the method wasn't called. And we will, uh, our action in, uh, at this stage is uh, applic calling application will finish launching with options on the SUT. But we need an application object. So let's take uh, UI application shirt, and we can use this one. So let's perform an action. Application will finish launching with options. Let's supply it with an empty dictionary of options. And now we can assert that actually uh, this action we wanted to happen, happened. So we have this uh, test, and our application sort of crashed. Uh, I'm using XCT assert macros, but uh, test doesn't work in the same way it works uh, in XC test case subclass because it's a playground. So I can only get that an assertion uh, took place. But this tells us that actually we need to implement the desired behavior. So we wanted to call this load in our method. So let's do it right now. And our task should disappear. I mean, uh, the, the warning or the error should disappear, and it did. So. This was TDD approach we follow. And thanks to this TDD uh, approach, we can describe behavior by writing unit tests. We don't have to comment our code because tests will describe our uh, behavior of our object. And this is actually a fail safe 
for changes that someone uh, may introduce in the future to our code. But the world of iOS applications is not simple because it's an asynchronous world. We usually use main thread for uh, handling UI or changing something on the user interface, but we should dispatch heavy tasks on uh, background threads. We can use, for example, uh, Dispatch Queue, which is a Swift wrapper for Grand Central Dispatch. And we can think uh, we can think of a queue as if it was a thread, because every queue usually has a corresponding thread, so I'll be using these terms interchangeably. Again, we have this message loader protocol, which is uh, which tells us that this operation will be uh, an asynchronous operation. We also have message fetching protocol, which returns array of, uh, and it has this fetch messages uh, function, and it returns an array of messages. And this uh, method declaration tells us that this will be a synchronous operation. Not asynchronous, but synchronous. So let's introduce message store object that confronts this protocol. Again, we can use here an empty array as a return value. We have our message that was introduced previously. Let's say our product manager told us that uh, it would be nice if we welcome our users with uh, some welcome message, right? So here it is, and we will use it in a moment. Our, let's implement message loader. It has store from which it will fetch messages. And there is our load method. Here we use dispatch queue uh, dot global and it return, it will, actually this call async will uh, dispatch a work that's contained in this closure, it will dispatch it to the main thread. Uh, we will simulate heavy operations by slipping this thread for one, one second, and then we'll return whatever store returns uh, with this callback, to this callback. So let's write a standard unit test and let's see what happens. Uh, we write unit test by subclassing XC test case, and usually we have this SUT in every test that we initialize in setup method, and we clean up after a test in teardown method. Let's test that at least one message is returned on load. So SUT is our message loader. Uh, we have a container for fetching messages. We perform this load method on SUT. We get some messages, so let's assign them. Let's assign fetch to messages array. And then we can assert that actually we have at least uh, one message. Now uh, our assertion should fail. So test is red over here. Oh, it's not, surprising. It is, good. Let's implement the behavior on message loader. So let's uh, return here our welcome message. And this red gun here should disappear. No, it didn't. Probably something is wrong. So something is wrong. What's wrong? Code run asynchronously. So we can notice that by paying attention to logs, or it fails because of a different reason.
Just bear with me a moment. Good, so we make this assertion in line 200. So, uh, execution order of execution is like this. Uh, we have an assertion of the main thread, we print messages which are empty, and then we assert that it isn't empty, and clearly it fails. And maybe if I run it again, it will show us that the background thread, so the callback, is called asynchronously somewhere later. And only after that, our messages change. So how can we test asynchronous behaviors, asynchronous code? We need to use XCTest expectation class. Then we have this stack that was presented a moment ago. So we have message loader, message store, and we have our tests. So uh, how can we use XCTest expectation? We just need to create an instance of XCTest expectation. And it has this initializer with the description that we can use. So still our assumption is that uh, the callback should be invoked with at least one message. So whenever a callback gets called, we can assert actually that messages uh, contains at least one message. So let's assert messages is empty equals false. And if assertion is okay, if test passes, we can fulfill our expectation. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to wait for this expectation for a certain timeout. So let's wait for two seconds because we slept it for one second. and uh, our test should pass. And we can, again, see the logs, how the execution goes on the main thread. So we start our test, we have this call here, main thread before wait, then we enter our callback and the background thread, we can uh, print our messages, and then we have this statement for uh, uh, on the main thread again after the wait. So actually this wait blocks our main thread for two seconds and probably pulls uh, if the expectation was fulfilled. Then we finish the test. So what are the drawbacks of this approach? So the triple A's arrange act assert is not clearly visible. This is the first drawback. And the second is, of course, code runs asynchronously and we don't have full control over it. And it adds some overhead. Execution might be longer, especially if we deal with flaky tests, and somebody increases the timeout. If we increase timeout for 10 seconds, and we know that uh, this test failed, uh, we would have to, our running time of unit test increases, basically. So unreadability, we have this assert phase, somewhat indented in the callback, it's not clearly visible, and we don't know actually how to test how to name this phase waiting phase. It's not an assert phase, so who knows. Then we don't have full control. We don't know when the callback will be invoked. And we also don't know what the value of the timeout should be. I've seen a dozen of timeouts of 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and the majority of times there should be less. And we have this overhead of execution. So uh, if test is flappy, never increase timeouts. Timeouts should be somewhere around 100 milliseconds. But we can do better than that. We can run our unit test synchronously. So let's do that. Again, we have the same stack of messages, loaders, and uh, we can introduce a protocol. Let's call it dispatching. 
and it has this one method called dispatch, and it takes an or, as an argument a closure of a work to dispatch on a background thread. Let's create a common superclass for other classes. Uh, it contains a dispatch queue, so every subclass will get this initializer if it inherits from the dispatcher. And let's introduce an asynchronous dispatcher. An async dispatcher uh, inherits from the dispatcher class, and it confirms to this dispatching protocol. By implementing this method, it executes job asynchronously on a queue, on a dispatch queue. And asynchronous uh, dispatch means that we just put stuff to this queue and it will be invoked somewhere in the future, or executed somewhere uh, sometime in the future. We can also have a synchronous dispatcher, and this time job is executed on a queue synchronously. <coughs> synchronous dispatch means the calling thread, so the thread that uh, calls this sync method on a queue waits for execution of job dispatched to this queue. And on, only after it finishes, execution of program goes to line 139 and returns from the function. So our message loader changes a bit. Now we have a queue that confirms this dispatching protocol and this class only sees, sees an interface. So class knows that it can call this part on a queue, and that's it. So we initialize uh, this loader with a queue. And in load method, what change? We just call this part instead of this part queue dot global dot async. And nothing else changed. We can also add some syntactic sugar to our async dispatcher and sync dispatcher, we can pre-populate some, uh, let's call them queues or dispatchers. So we have access to main queue, to global queue and background queue. And we can do the same for sync dispatcher. And now the last part, uh, in our tests, we just need to uh, set a synchronous, sorry, asynchronous doesn't sound good. We need to create synchronous dispatcher. Let's call it background. And we can use a global queue or background queue. And we just need to switch queues. So our SUT has this uh, queue property. Let's uh, use this background synchronous dispatcher. And something doesn't work. Sync dispatcher to the background. Oh, it's dispatch queue. Okay, not like this. Uh, so what I wanted to do is to use background. Here and it should compile. And here in act phase, actually, we don't need to do anything because this code will run, syn will run synchronously. So, what we need to do is just to make an assertion in the assert phase. So, let's do that. Again, we want to assert that our messages aren't empty. And if I did everything uh, good, it should work. As we see from the logs, we start the test. We have an arrange uh, phase on the main thread. Then we have an act phase on the main thread. Our callback gets called on a background thread. We print our messages here in the callback. And then we enter assert phase on the main thread. So we have full control over the execution of the unit test. What happens? Unit tests are run on the main thread. 
So we run our test at least one message on load function. Then it calls uh, load on our SUT. Then uh, our SUT dispatches job to a queue, but it does it synchronously. So we have this background thread. It performs some work in background. The main thread waits for the background thread until it finishes execution. And then uh, background thread calls completion block, completion closure with messages it fetched. And it's all synchronous. So this one thing we should be aware of when using this approach, which is deadlock. Imagine this situation. We have this load method on message loader, but this time we want to uh, get job done asynchronously on the background thread, but we want callback to be invoked on the main thread. Similar stack as we had previously with message and all the protocols. This time our message loader would look uh, differently. We have main queue and background queue. An initializer gets this queue, gets this queue, and sets them as properties. Our load method now dispatches job on the background queue, but dispatches callback on the main queue. Actually, I didn't say what the deadlock is. So in multi-threading, all the deadlock uh, can occur whenever uh, one thread enters a waiting state uh, because, of, because it dispatches, for example, jobs synchronously to a different thread. And if this secondary thread tries to dispatch something synchronously to the first thread, and it also enters waiting state, we have a loop. Every thread waits for another thread to finish its execution, but they cannot because the dispatch works uh, work synchronously to each other. We can have that log in our uh, message loader when we use synchronous dispatcher on main queue. And we can also break it. So this is the uh, image that shows the situation, right? So we have the synchronous dis uh, dispatch to the background thread, but then background thread dispatches job synchronously to the main thread. And because main thread didn't finish previous operation and waits for this thread to finish, the other cannot finish as well. So uh, situation with no deadlock, how can we break it? Uh, we need to create two queues. First of them, uh, let's start with background. So again, we can use same dispatcher the background for that. But for main, main queue, we want still uh, our test run synchronously. So what we need to do is just to uh, dispatcher. To switch queue, queues, we will use global queue as the main queue. Okay, unused variables. And then we need to switch those queues on our SUT. So we will use this uh, global queue as our main queue and still background as background. Oops. It compiles. And again, the last thing we need to do is to make an assertion that our messages are an empty. And we can see from the logs that code still runs synchronously. I'm going to put that in a moment. Oh, please, come on, it's wrong. So we have main thread, main thread, then callback on a global thread. Uh, and then again, insertion in the main thread. Again, we have full control over tests. And we don't have any deadlock because we use three queues. The main thread on which unit tests are run, 
then they dispatch jobs synchronously to a background thread, which dispatch callback to another background thread. So, uh, takeaway for you. Asynchronous tests are unreadable, can give some overhead. Uh, we need to manage timeouts uh, for them, and we don't have full control over asynchronous tests. Synchronous tests has readable arrange, act, and assert phases. Uh, there is no need to increase timeout whenever a test fails, and we have full control over them. So that's it. Any questions? I got two questions. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, it can be yours. I remember that there is another question. Um, since you mentioned that you guys practice uh, pair programming, right? So how does this unit has come into you know practice? So the question is, uh, how much do we practice unit testing and TDD? Yeah, uh, yeah. and how effective is uh, pair programming compared to the traditional solo programming? So I think the, uh, the best benefit you can get, benefit you can get is that we uh, learn from each other. Everyone has different background. And uh, it's better to have two pairs of eyes at the same code because you can, the one person can uh, see things that the other person does not. And we don't use, for that reason that we use uh, per programming, we don't tap into code review process. Because basically per programming is a sort of a code review. So do you uh, write the test alongside developing the feature, or you do it after you finish developing it? Uh, depends on the feature, because of course, uh, TDD, demands uh, having some knowledge about the platform. So if you're a very experienced developer, you can just dive into uh, writing tests at first and then implementing the feature if you know how to implement it in advance. But there, are, there are times when you just don't know and you need to play around, do some spikes, right? How to implement features. So, uh, but the majority of times we uh, write tests first, then uh, we uh, implement the features or the, whatever the task is, and what it uh, what it gives us is uh, simple implementations, and we can also write tests for edge cases for our source code. These were two questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the other question. Um, thanks. Um, so in, in the synchronous uh, test case, uh, we ran into you know, the possibilities that Bob can unwrap it by um, introducing additional queues, right? Yeah. Um, why not go the other way? Since you're already blocking the main queue to do all the synchronous executions, why not just run everything on the main queue and never have deadlock? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter much, or maybe I'm missing out. Yeah, could be. That could be also. I haven't thought about it. Okay. This, one this is why. Thanks. Hi, uh, most of the time, right, when we create an uh, async method, we create a uh, progressing block, right? But next, that's not the only way to uh, create async method. There's another way, like, let's say, target action. And I'm having a difficulty to test, like, target action method. Do you know a way to, like, test this kind of function? I said, what, uh, what would you like to test? I didn't get this part. Uh, uh, I created a method, uh, yes. this a uh, target action method. Yeah. So, is there a way to like do unit testing on this kind of method? Mm -hmm. Because the the return is like being written to another function. Right? I cannot think about it at the moment, but we can discuss it after the uh, presentation. I can come up with with anything at the moment. Any other questions? Yes, please. So your example mock a third party service, right? And that's <coughs> asynchronous. Uh, you mean the, the message loader, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can think about it okay. in this way. Yeah. So do you, do you, 
how detailed are your mocks? Basically, okay. how detailed are my mocks? Yeah. Uh, so it's good to describe the interface your mock in terms of protocol. So you can uh, confirm to this protocol and implement all the methods. And uh, you don't need to have all the uh, checks for Boolean variables that method was called or wasn't. It depends on which methods you use on the mocked objects. Uh, but actually, at the moment, we don't have much Swift code. We use Objective-C, and we can tap into OCMob to perform some studying and checking some bodies and assertions. Um, because sometimes I find my mocks need tests now because they are so complicated. <laughs> yeah, so mocks should be, I think they shouldn't contain any logic, just Boolean values toggled. And uh, what else? Uh, I Previously, I wrote, when I wrote some uh, unit tests, I, for example, had to describe an certification center in terms of protocol. So just I left empty implementations for any methods I, I didn't use but I was able to describe notification center in terms of protocol and I was able to check only parts of the implementations I used. Any other questions? Good, so let's call it a day. Thank you.